Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, it's a webinar um, covering a variety of library activities, um, topics, um, pretty much anything. If it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the show. We're pretty open with that. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, and they are recorded. So if you're unable to join us live on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always go to our website, and we have all the recordings of all of our sessions um, there, along with any related materials um, that you would want to be going over while you're watching the recording. And we do all sorts of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, uh, interviews, um, anything. And we have commission staff and guest speakers that sometimes come in. And this morning, we actually have commission staff here with me. <laughs> Laura Johnson, who is the Continuing Education Coordinator here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, just, she has a presentation she's going to share with us today about customer service. Customer service means convenience is the topic, as you can mm -hmm. see there. Um, Something that is very important in our libraries, I think, I how you so, yeah. uh, deal with your your customers, your patrons, your users, whatever you want to call them, um, can make a huge impact on whether you're successful or not. So, yes, I'm going to hand over to Laura and have her take over. And well, good morning. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's certainly kind of gray and rainy here in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I understand yes. some of you are having winter again. Um, but I hope you're all inside and warm. Um, we are going to talk today about how customer service means convenience. And um, hey. I like to start with, as you know, I like to start almost everything with the five laws of library science. <laughs> I just think Ranganathan was really on to something here. Um, this one... I think we're really talking about law number four, save the time of the reader. Mm -hmm. um, people are busy, and I think making our libraries convenient uh -huh. really lowers barriers for people. Um, so what's the situation? Uh, I have a lot of evidence that leads me to believe that convenience is very important. So let's go through it. Um, first. The Harris Poll says that Americans read. Three in ten Americans say their favorite activity is reading. So that's pretty good. Um, and in a, in a study called the Customer Focused Library, when they talked to people, uh, two-thirds of the people um, who came in the library came in to browse. They really didn't know what they wanted, or they knew they wanted a book, but they didn't know which one, before they came in. 70% of the people who came into the library checked out books. So books are still very key. 95% of the people they saw visited at least once a month. So you're, you've got fairly frequent visitors. These are regulars. Um, most of them came in alone. Now certainly there are some families that come in, but when people come in alone, they tend um, to kind of be a little bit more focused. Uh, only 12% of the people who come in look at the signs. It's mm -hmm. kind of sad. We put so much time but, and, and effort they and don't look at the angst signs. into yeah. what do I do with this sign? How do I make it right? And yeah. yeah, they don't look at the signs. Mm -hmm. But 50 and 56% of them, that's more than half, spent fewer than 10 minutes in the library. So they came in because they wanted a book, and they got in and they got out. And AV is a third of the circulation. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing people who want to use the library, but kind of are ready to do it quick. Um, it's, you know, I'd like to think that it was a pleasant thing for them to do, but it's another errand to run in a busy life. Um, this is a copy of the um, study that this is from. Uh, it is available on Web Junction or at OCLC. Uh, it's a very interesting study. If you haven't read it, um, their methodology was wonderful. Uh, they really borrowed from the idea of retail. 
Um, and of course, retailers study a lot about what brings people into an establishment, what makes them stay there, uh, how they feel about it. And I think we can learn a lot from retailers. But they took uh, certain methodologies that retailers use and applied them in the library and really came up with some very interesting results um, that they then put, they did, then did some things about and found that um, their circulation had increased in the library. So it was effective um, and it's worth taking a look at the study. Uh, this, I just love this quote. Um, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, we kind of thought there was one already, didn't we? We called it a library, um, although it doesn't come to your door. And that's one of the things, because what was Netflix really offering? What does it offer? It offers convenience. I mean, isn't that the key thing that Netflix is offering? And this is what someone is saying. I'd really like to have something really convenient where I could get a book when I want one. The library brand is books. Um, this is something that we, we've tried to broaden our appeal and things, but 75% of Americans said books when they're asked what do they think of when they think of a library. So we need to work with that. Even though there are other things we're doing, we want them yes. to think of them as well, we still need to embrace the fact that they think of us for books, and I that's think, what we yeah. can still and be providing to them. There's no pro there's nothing no, wrong no, with that there's at nothing. all. But it's kind it's of like... Part of like give the customer what they want? Yeah, <laughs> sort of. But it's also, you have to work with where you are. You can't say, oh no, now we're going to be different. Mm -hmm. If people think this is who you are, then you have to work with that. And it use is it. To, yeah, and use, use it. it to your advantage. Bring them in for um, the books, and then you yeah, can show them yeah. other stuff. But here's, I thought this was, because so much of what we do, uh, service to children is so important, and yet 70% of the children in families have either two working parents or they live in a single parent household with a working parent. What does this mean? It means that if the kids can't get to the library on their own, and some kids can, but a lot of kids can't, mm -hmm. they can't get to the library during the day when their parents are working. 65% of children under six have two working parents, or they're in a single parent household where the parent works. So parents are busy and parents are working, um, which does have a profound effect on how we can serve children. Um, it's also people have less leisure time. Uh, as far as people reporting how much leisure time they have, it has dropped. Only 16 hours. Um, so this means that people are busy and they are feeling a, a pressure, a time pressure. Um, on an average day, what do they, how do they spend their leisure time? Well, okay. They spend it watching TV. But they're doing other things too. And, but reading only gets 18 minutes. So if we want reading to be important to people, we have to make it easy and available. Because, I'm sorry, I've got to think that one of the reasons we're all watching TV is that it's there. Mm -hmm. It's easy. You just have to sit, you know. Um, but it's kind of interesting when you see what people are doing with their leisure time. Uh, it's very interesting they ask people um, who lived within two miles of the library and 58 percent of the people used the library. When it was more than two miles, 58 percent didn't use the library. So more people use the library if they're close to it. Now why this matters I'm not sure because I don't imagine that many people are walking to the library, frankly. I think most people are driving. And, you know, two miles, five miles, does it matter that much? But evidently it does. So maybe it's more a matter of this keeps it fresh in their minds. They're reminded of the library more. But it does mean that being close is key. 
Uh, one of the explanations for some of this is what the principle of least effort, mm -hmm. which is also Zipf's law. And they have done studies that show that in information seeking, people will use the most convenient way, the easiest way to find the information. They will stop as soon as they found what they think is good enough. Mm -hmm. They don't keep going to find the very best or find it all. They stop and they want tools that are familiar and easy to use. Again, what does this mean? They want convenience. They want it to be easy. They want it to be quick. When they've done studies of circulation, uh, Shaw did one, it's quite old, but um, shelves just inside the door of the library circulated 24% more books than shelves just 15 feet further on. So that idea that people are picking up the first thing they see and it's good enough is very much a part of how people behave in the library. Books on the middle shelves are checked out a lot more often. Look <laughs> at the mm. percentage of the books that are picked, checked out from the bottom shelf. They're harder to see. They're harder to reach. And I really, I think, to, to be fair to people, it's probably more a matter of their being hard to see. It really is hard to look down there and, you know, and very few people are going to crawl around the mm -hmm. aisle. So the books on the middle shelf get checked out more often. What kind of implications does this have for us? Well, it may mean that we need to shift our libraries fairly often so that things get moved. I think it also means that we need to forget the bottom shelf. Just pretend that we don't ever keep anything, and don't ever keep anything on the bottom shelf. It, it'll immediately just, you know, improve everybody's life. Um, when people are asked about using search engines to find material versus using the library to find material, an awful lot of them think search engines are more convenient, they're faster, and they're easier to use. I, I don't know. Do we need to make ourselves more like Google? Probably not, because I don't think we, we do that very well. How would you physically do that in a library? Well, exactly. But we do need to re realize that as a librarian, I, I know when people ask me a question, if I worked at a reference desk, and I have worked at reference desks, you wanted to find them the best information and the information that would really be helpful and all the information they could use. It turns out that isn't what they wanted. They wanted something fast. Now, myself, I have always blamed microwave ovens for this. <laughs> um, because I think as soon as you can cook a hot dog in one minute, it's... You've got it's, this concept it, of instant gratification yes, and everything like my microwave. Absolutely. But uh, it still means that people want convenient, fast, and easy to use. So that's one thing. People are busy. They want things to be convenient. And now here's another interesting study. I thought this was fascinating. They did an experiment with jam, and they went into supermarkets, again, we were borrowing from the retailers, mm -hmm. and they gave people, um, in one part of the experiment, they gave people choices to sample from six different kinds of jam. And another one, they gave samples from 30 different kinds of jam. And people's sampling behavior was very similar, whether it was six choices or 30 choices. But when it came to buying jam, 30% of the people who had sampled from six different kinds of jam bought jam. Only 3% of the people who sampled from 30 different kinds of jam bought jam. More choices kind of paralyze people mm -hmm. sometimes. It makes it harder for them to choose. More choice does not mean more satisfaction. Um, in fact, they have done other studies where um, they, for instance, gave people a chocolates. And people who chose a piece of chocolate from a small box 
were more satisfied with their choice than people who chose one piece from a large box. Um, students were told that they could write extra credit papers. And the students who had only a few uh, choices of the subject to write it on, more of them wrote papers than students who had a lot of choices about their subject, and they wrote better papers. So choice is definitely a, a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. It's good for people to have choices, and people want choices, and they want to feel that they're in charge of what they do, but in fact, too many choices uh, can create difficulties for people. So what is the situation so far? What, if, what are we talking about? Well, a lot of people enjoy reading, so we're offering them something they enjoy. Um, not everyone thinks about libraries when they think about reading, but people who do think about libraries think books. So people are associating libraries with books and reading. People are busy. Their behavior indicates they tend to go with the readily available and the easiest to use. And too much choice is confusing and leads to lower satisfaction. What does this say to us about how we need to present our libraries, how we need to present our materials, how we need to present our services? Uh, one thing you may have heard about recently, I think there's been a lot of uh, talk about it, is UX. User experience. Now, a lot of this, uh, there's been a lot of study of especially how people react to websites because, um, especially commercial websites that have advertising, the more people come to your website and the more people, the longer they stay, the more they see the advertising, so the more money you're making. But it's still a matter of user experience in terms of are they finding what they need? Are they satisfied with the website? And then you can, and this has been extended to the user experience in other avenues as well, besides websites. But one of the think, things... Yeah, a lot of yeah. people think user experience, they just think, oh, that just means the website, I'm not the webmaster, I'm yeah. not in charge, that's not me. It's not the user experience of the website, it's the user experience of your library. There can wherever be. Wherever they are, if they walk yes. in the door, if they go on the web, if they walk past the building, does that, yeah. Absolutely. And it's very interesting because one of the things that user experience does is it says that behavior is a more accurate indicator than disclosure. So what does this mean? Watching what people do is a better indicator of how they feel than what they say. And that's because most people are very, very nice. And they're mm -hmm. going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Or they're going to tell you they don't want to hurt your feelings. So we do have to be really aware of what people do in our libraries. And uh, user experience is something we really have to be concerned about. Because people have a lot of choices of where they're going to spend their time. And what they're going to do with their leisure time. And if we want them to come to the library, if we want them to read, we need to make it easy, fast, satisfying, you know. Um, this is actually a set of articles that's being written in UX Magazine by a, an Australian company called Different. And they're, they talk about the seven essentials of customer-centric business. Well, if libraries... I don't know how you get more customer-centric than a library. And I thought this was really interesting um, and had a lot of um, implications for us. So I'd like to spend a little time going through this. Um, you see the seven things sort of in a pyramid. Predictability is the first one, and that's how much the user can foresee the result of an interaction. And they say... This is what McDonald's has done. This is why they're so successful. People kind of know what they're going to get. And so there aren't any surprises. They feel like they're in control. They trust. And they feel safe. And they feel that it's reliable. And so this is what they want. They want predictability. Um, if they, People do enjoy 
a surprise, something new, but only in terms of something that doesn't rock their world, really. People don't want their worlds rocked. Um, the second thing is efficiency, and this is the degree to which customer effort is facilitated. They want it to be easy. They want it to be quick. They don't want the people putting barriers in the way of their getting what they need. Um, then we have convenience, and what are we talking about here? Reducing the physical or cognitive barriers to use. And there's kind of several parts to convenience. One flow, it's putting services next to related services, making in a shoe store selling the shoelaces is flow because that's putting a related product with, you know, if somebody's in there, they can also get their other footwear needs. Um, so in a library, we would want to have something related. For instance, as we are doing, we not only have books to read, we have e-readers. We have Overdrive. We're offering e-books because that's putting services into context. Perception. We're meeting expectations. If people expect us to have books, then we need to have books. Um, if we can't meet expectations, and sometimes people have unrealistic expectations, we need to try to either lower their expectations or change them. Um, but people do expect something to meet their expectations. And control. This is one of the things they talk about that um, is a big thing in like um, Disney World where people have to stand in line. If you give people, um, if for one thing, if you tell them about how long the line is going to be, mm -hmm. and if you give them something to look at or um, a distraction while they're in line, then they don't feel um, out of control. They don't feel that they're just waiting on you. They feel that their time is being respected and that they know what's going to happen. So, um, you know, how do we do this? Well, if we happen to have a long line, then maybe you do want something where people, uh, a bulletin board or something where people can look at something while they're waiting. Um, it just means we have to really think about how we handle these things. Then personality is your style, really. Uh, people want you to have a particular style. They want you to be authentic. And they want you to be consistent. Consistency is important. Um, and then personal, they want it, they want a relationship with you. Um, they want you to recognize them uh, when they come in, but they want things customized. They want things that really suit them. And strangely, people don't want you to get over personal. They don't want you to, to feel like you're using this to get. Um, they, they want you to be, to acknowledge them as people and acknowledge their personal needs, but not to get, not to go too far. So I thought this was really interesting, worth reading the articles. Um, they are online. Uh, yeah, and actually, while since you've been going through this, you yeah. haven't mentioned all of the links that um, Laura's mentioning, these yes. reports and articles about this are being added to the Commission's Delicious account. So when the recording is put up, these slides will be with it, as well as um, links to everything that she's talking about here. So you'll be able to find yes. all these reports and studies and everything um, afterwards. I actually do have a bibliography. And there, yes. yes, there's actually a bibliography as well that has them all listed too. Yeah. That'll be up there. Um, so. What are the aspects of convenience? Uh, I think we talked about these a little bit. First, there's actual convenience, which is the reduction of physical effort or time required to do things. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Flow, the inclusion of related products, and things having a logical structure. Um, you know, we need the book drop kind of so people can return books before they check out more books. 
or however you think that flows, but people want to flow. And perceptions. Uh, they want their uncertainty reduced, and they want it in active time uh, filled in. And then they need control. They need to feel that they know what is going on and that they're on top of it. Um, so when you look it up in the dictionary, what, what do they say about the word convenient? Well, three definitions, allowing you to do something easily or without trouble. I think that's pretty much what we'd all agree. Uh, located in a place that's easy to get to. Okay. Or giving you a reason to do something that you want to do. This is a more modern concept. But it's kind of profound, too. We really need to think about that. Give people a reason to come to the library because you know you want to. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what we're talking about. What would make the library more convenient? We've talked about people's convenience. We've talked about people's need to have choice, but not too much choice. Um, we've talked, you know, about the, the steps of being a customer-centric business. Now, what makes the library more convenient? What would it help? Well, there are four stages of convenience, um, according to some of the, uh, again, we're, we're going back to the retailers. And remember, convenience stores are a whole category of retailing. And, and they've really gone into this to figure out why people would come in their stores and what they can offer. And they say there are four stages of convenience. Access, search, possession, and transaction. So what are these? Well, access is the factors that affect how easy it is to travel to the library and enter it. Um, and what are some of those factors? Well, a lot of them, whether the people are actually have disabilities or not. These guides for small business on the ADA um, requirements really cover a lot of categories of things to make um, a, uh, a facility convenient for people, to make it um, easy to access. And it's easy to reach, easy to ask questions, um, how many steps from the parking lot, what are your hours? Uh, all of these affect access. Um, are your sidewalks even? Are they shoveled in the winter? Are the bushes trimmed so that they aren't uh, narrowing up the sidewalk? That kind of thing. And yes, uh, in some of our libraries, we don't completely control these things. But in some of our libraries, we do have control of some of them. And we really need to think about them. Then the next thing is search. And what is search? Well, it's uh, identifying and selecting materials. Remember, most people didn't know what they wanted when they came in, the, or exactly what they wanted mm -hmm. when they came in the library. So how do I people identify and select materials? Well, we have signs, <laughs> maybe too many signs. And I love this sign because it, it would be a great sign if we knew what an OPAC was. Yeah. Now, I know what an OPAC you know. is, and you know. But it's does everybody know what an OPAC is? Um, Not a clue. We use the catalog. We use the computer. And people are ready to, you, to look things up. But have we made it easy? I don't know. Um, it turns out that there, are a lot of, there is some research on terminology we use. Uh, to help direct people to things, and sometimes people don't understand them. Um, they tend to misunderstand terms like database or library catalog or e-journals. Uh, often they don't understand uh, acronyms or the term serial or reference or resource. So we need to really be careful and try to translate as much as we can into regular English. Um, Cooper Smith, who's done a lot of this, says that what we need to do is test things before we have so put up signs, like that OPAC sign, or um, the way we, we talk about things. We need to test to make sure that people did understand it. Um, avoid the terms that people 
misunderstand, use the natural language, um, offer explanations, offer pictures if you need to, to enhance, um, to uh, provide your glossary. Uh, this is on your website, provide a glossary of your terms, uh, provide intermediate pages, give people more than one way to get to something. Um, it may be a little tricky sometimes, but this, it helps lower the level of uh, frustration. And that's just terribly important when people want to find things. Also, we want to display. Some research has shown that as much as 50% of the materials that are on display get checked out. Partly this has to do, remember we talked about choice behavior? and how too many choices aren't, are, are confusing for people. So we're offering them fewer choices. In effect, we're recommending things to them. So, you know, they, oh, well, that looks good. And the funny thing is, displays that are over elaborate sometimes don't work as well as simple displays. Because if they're really elaborate, people don't want to mess them up. People are really nice and they, oh, it's so pretty, I, I can't mess it up. I don't want to take that book off yeah. of that nice way you've displayed it and yes. all the, the decoration around it. Yeah. And, yeah. So you want to have displays that do show off the books, but don't, but will encourage people to take the books from the display. But this makes it easy for people to identify and find materials when we have them on display. So we need to do a lot of displays in our libraries and change them often. Now possession. Make it easy to obtain the materials. Um, if we don't have a book that someone wants, can we get it on your library loan quickly? Um, you know, make sure that the, the stacks, again, those bottom shelves, um, and make sure that, you know, they can, they can get things. Now, what factors make it easier or difficult? Well, again, you know, is the book up high? Is the book down too low? Um, is it where it belongs? Um, do we have a lot of different uh, places where you could look for something? You know, you need to think about those things. Um, remember also the Pareto principle that 20% of your books or materials are responsible for 80% of your circulation. It's good not to have things on the shelf that aren't working for you, basically. Um, and now, most of us are using the Dewey Decimal System. And the Dewey Decimal System does some things for us that we need to acknowledge. Um, it keeps things in order. It puts uh, things together, it puts similar things together on the shelf. Um, it lets us add new things without completely redoing the library. So DDC does a lot, but it is confusing for a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, those numbers, when they get too big, um, sometimes people just kind of don't get it. On the other hand, Dewey's pretty standard. A lot of people are used to using it. Um, here's a library. This one is in New the Newcastle Regional Library in Australia. And these are books that have Dewey Decimal numbers, but then are also labeled. Now, yeah, people don't always look at signs. It's true. But this is doing, and see how many of these books are face out? This is doing our best. To, and see that they're not too tall, the shelves aren't too tall. Um, it's doing our best to make sure that people can locate materials. Looks like a bookstore. Well, yes. <laughs> and BISG is a classification scheme. Uh, the Book Industry Study Group does have a classification scheme that bookstores use. Uh, some libraries are going to it. It has its pluses and minuses. Um, but I think for a very small collection, we might want to think about it, or we certainly might want to think about labeling our Dewey sections so that people can find more readily what they're looking for. 
Yeah. And then, I remember when I yeah. was in elementary school mm -hmm. in the yeah the elementary school library. It was Dewey, of course, and they tried to teach it to us, but I remember science, too. Oh, yeah. This is the section for this. So they, I mean, this, this was a long time ago that I won't say. Um, <laughs> so at my librarian there at my elementary school is already realizing the kids don't, obviously kids may be having trouble with the numbers, put up a sign that says this is where the books on dinosaurs are or yeah. whatever. Why not continue that with public libraries? Yeah. Yes. And it also, you have to realize that the Dewey number that comes with the book yeah. isn't sacred. Yeah. If you'd like it in a different place in your library, you can move it. Local you can practice give it a, is great in cataloging, yes. Yeah, you can give it a different number. And then transaction, which is, are we making it easy to check out and return materials? Um, self-checkout. People like self-checkout. They think that that puts them in charge, and it's very quick. On the other hand, um, some people also like some human contact, too. Um, one of the things that you might want to think about is your desk. Is it, may, is it labeled circulation? Because I always mm -hmm. think of this when I think of circulation. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps a plain language sign mm -hmm. is um, easier for people to deal with. Okay, also the library card. Used to be we had little cards. Well, I still have a card. Yeah. But now we've, we've also moved to the, the hang tags from your keys because that's more convenient for people. And now you can have it on your smartphone. Starbucks does it. Yes. And there's, you know, the population that has smartphones is growing by leaps and bounds. A lot of people have smartphones. Starbucks did discounts like this, and Joanne Fabrics does on the mm -hmm. phone. You bring the, your, if you look up, you can get your discounts and things on the phone. They scan it right into their um, checkout. Yeah. And you get your uh, coupon off or whatever. Yep. It also makes you look cool and hip and with it. <laughs> um, yes. But, uh, you, you know, think about these things that then people don't have to remember their library card because they already have their phone. Mm -hmm. um, anything that can streamline, we're talking about streamlining, this is what helps people. Unfortunately, what's convenient for some people may not be convenient or important to other people. And um, these four categories of people, and of course, People are people. They're not always absolute. They don't all absolutely fit into a category. But generally, the silent generation, people who are now 70 or older, they're accustomed to the top-down flow. They're accustomed to a stable learning environment. They prefer to have material organized, summarized, so the Reader's Digest was, you know, a product for them. Um, the Dewey Decimal System is organized and summarized. Um, so older people may feel more comfortable with that kind of thing. But boomers now, people who, well, are getting older every day, Kevin knows, but uh, they want feedback and they want things to be interactive, but they don't want authoritarian. And they like things that are easy to scan. So they're people magazine people. Um, quick articles, quick um, interactions. Um, but boomers, of course, are going to be, re well, they've started retiring now. Uh, the oldest boomers are going to be 70. Mm. And, um, you know, these are people who could be great volunteers and great uh, advocates for the library. So... You know, you might want to think about what they like. Now, when we get to Gen X, uh, these people are very independent. They learn by doing. Uh, they're very visual. And for those people, perhaps some graphics um, and things and fast company wired are the kinds of things they like. And we have the millennials. They like, they're using Google. They like very lively materials, varied materials. Um, 
but these are people who are used to using computers and they're used to teamwork. They like teamwork. So, yes, different people do like different things. Kind of makes it more interesting, doesn't it? But what things can you do right now to make your library more convenient? What can you do today? Well, I think first, um, make staffers easy to identify. You know, it's true. The people who come in your library most often know you. But not everyone does. And we can't always assume, oh yeah, everybody knows me. Um, although, I have to say, when I'm in a library, people always ask me questions. I think I have a tattoo on my forehead or something. <laughs> it's some sort of vibe or yeah, pheromone absolutely. or something. Yeah, like very in pheromone going out. Yeah. Must be. But uh, making your staffers easy to identify, certainly with name tags, if not with shirts, or myself, of course. I've been trying to, you know, encourage the idea of lab coats for a long time. I think they make people look... Um, they make people look professional. They uh, keep you clean because libraries are a dirty business. And um, you certainly can have them for your volunteers and stuff and just have a few of them that then people can, you know, any volunteer can wear. So I think, uh, or tiaras, we can all wear tiaras. <laughs> I think that'd be good too. But make your staffers easy to identify. Make it easy to ask a question. And then offer assistance to people. Um, may I help you is probably not quite, but you know, hey, we're here if you have any questions or may I, can I help you find something is good. Use the lay language. Really try not to use that terminology, um, that librarian-ish terminology. Um, display, 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 and display. Um, the more displays you have, the better. Um, even on your main, in your main stacks, if you can turn some books face out, that's good. Um, change displays, re, refresh displays often. Um, you really want to display. It helps people. Declutter. One of the things, you know, one of the things that happens is that we come in our libraries every day and we get to the point where we don't really see them anymore. They have so much meaning for us that we're not looking at them objectively. And so I don't think we always notice the clutter. And I don't mean that they're messy. I mean that we're offering several newsletters from several organizations and we have bookmarks and we have flyers for um, uh, programs we're going to be having and pretty soon the library is kind of cluttered. We want to declutter. We, we need to clean that up because the people who come in do look at it with, um, with a very objective eye. If you can't, trade off with somebody else and, and get um, your, you know, a, another librarian to come in and look at your library or get your sister-in-law from another mm -hmm. town to come in. Um, and they can tell you if your library is cluttered or not. Mm -hmm. um, another important thing they say. I just read, relating, yeah. relating to that, I just read something recently in the last couple of days about um, try and use your library as a customer, as a patron would. Yes. Use the bathrooms. Try to find something. If you can put yourself in the mindset of I'm not the librarian anymore, but if I was just a person coming in to try and use this, how does it look? Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's cool. How do you do that, though? I thought that, but my brain already has the librarian part working, and I'm thinking, well, that's good because I put it there, and that's good because I know it should work. Yeah. But that's even better. Ask someone else to come in yeah. and do a, what, like a mystery shopper. Yes, a mystery absolutely. Mystery library patron for you. Say, come in. I don't want to say anything to you, sister or friend. Let me know what you think works yeah. and what doesn't. Another thing you can do sometimes that helps you step back is take some pictures. With a digital mm -hmm. camera anymore, taking a picture is no big deal. But take your pictures from your library and see, do they look, how do they look? Um, another thing about clutter is they say that you shouldn't have flyers and bookmarks and things on your circulation desk. If you can have a place for them near the circulation desk where people pass by them, or if people are waiting in line to be 
to have their books checked out uh, can look at them while they're waiting, that's really good. But having them on the desk, they say, is not the best way. So we want to remember to really declutter, you know, really be tough about that. Then weed. I know that we just nag, nag, nag about this. Um, and it is hard because it's not a lot of fun and it's dirty and it means coming to grips with losing some books that are friends. But weeding really will help. Um, having more books does not necessarily mean you have a better library. In some ways it does, yes. You know, don't get rid of things you're using. But do remember that for everything that's on the shelf that someone doesn't need, it makes finding what he does need harder. So weeding really is key. And we have shown that when people have too many choices, it tends to be paralyzing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we want to display. But it also means that weeding is important. Don't use those bottom shelves. Just don't use them. Just, it, they're not working for people. Um, I would also say don't use the top shelves if they're seven feet high. But, you know, I'm vertically challenged, so <laughs> maybe other people would find that okay. Um, but if you don't use those bottom shelves, right away you put books where people are more likely to find them. And it also means, you know, you do need to move things around in your library from time to time so things get to live on a different shelf for a while. And then post your hours and your address. Um, they should be on your front door. They should be in the message that people get when they call the library and you're not open. Mm -hmm. um, they should be on your letterhead. They should be in your signature block when you send email. Um, you, we, we need to make sure that we aren't assuming that people know. Because, in fact, the core of the people who use the library do know. But we also want to reach the people who are not core. Uh, we'd like to make some of them our friends when they're not already. And so we can't assume that they know stuff. we got to help them out. And it's just, it's just less frustrating for people when they come up and they try to open your door and it's locked and there's no lights on inside. If the hours are right there on the door, then they know when they can come back. Um, when they call up and you've told them your hours, then they know. So I think that's really an important thing is um, make the obvious obvious. Um, so, that's kind of what we're talking about with convenience. I'm sure that you can think of a lot of other things. Um, think about the experiences you have when you do business with your bank, with your dry cleaner, with your grocer, with your um, auto repair shop, and the, see the lessons. Um, what are they doing that you really liked? What did they do that drove you crazy? And apply that to the library. And I think you'll find that it will help. And it will help you provide good customer service. So, are there any questions? <clears throat> if anybody, no questions came in during. Okay. But, um, if anybody does have any questions, type them into the questions section in your GoToWebinar interface. And Laura can answer them there. Um, I see you have a couple more final slides here, contact info or something, or? Yeah. Okay, the, li ah, yes. the list of sources is on our website. It will also be, as Krista said, on the, um, in our Delicious account, mm -hmm. and she will put it up with the um, PowerPoint slides. Okay. Yep. And there they are. There's all the sources. Don't transcribe that all down. No, don't. No. <laughs> I've added them all available. to Delicious while we yeah. were um, sitting here, and... The um, like she said, like Laura said, that actual PDF will be available as well for you to print out and use yourself. In too. fact, we can pull it out if you want. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, and the photos, I I, I have also, mm -hmm. um, 
and they were all cited the comments, them as you were, and yeah. I did cite the photos. Yep. So okay, yeah. And there's there it is. It's a PDF. So all those links so, are live. All the links that are mentioned in the PowerPoint are on this, so you'll be able to access this as well um, to print out and use as you want. I really do recommend that um, that one set of articles in UX. It's UX.com. Yeah, it's on here. Um, where was it? I think it's in the second page. The seven essentials. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And uh, uxmag.com it is. Yeah. And the um, the study, too, that they did, um, I thought, was very good. The one that's at OCLC. Mm -hmm. OCLC has a lot of good reports. Yeah. I'm also related to the customer service one. This uh, different company I found while well, I was just searching around online during the yeah. show. Um, their website itself yeah. Yeah, for the company. So I've added that to our delicious links as well. So some more information directly from them. Um, in mm -hmm. addition to what they um, published in this magazine, will be in there as well. So, any questions, comments? We have a thank you for very good ideas. Well, good. Okay. I hope. Anybody I hope have they any are. Any other questions, comments, ideas of your own that you'd want to share? Nothing urgent coming in. Okay. That's fine. You guys know where to find Laura here at the commission. So if you do have any questions, ideas, yeah. anything you want to share, um, you can contact her. Um, as I said, the session's been recorded. Thank you very much, Laura. That was oh, actually fun. very, yeah. Um, a lot of things that I think this is what a lot of people are needing to do now in libraries is thinking outside the library box, so to speak, and um, looking at, and this is something we've hopefully you've heard about before, looking at other businesses as resources for what we can do. The yeah. bookstores is a big one, of course, that everyone has compared us to because, you know, books, it's yeah. the same thing. But other things too, convenience stores, anything retail that gets their idea is pushing their product, getting people to buy their product. The same thing we're doing. We want people to buy, quote, yes. unquote, and our product, which is our and library providing a, Providing a good experience for people so they'll want to mm -hmm. come back. Yep. Yes. Um, I think I do think the libraries try to do this. Mm -hmm. um, we've tried, and we've got some good results for some things we do, and we can do other things as well. Yeah, I think outside the box. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, so, where is my? There we go. Aha. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you will join us next week when our topic is uh, easing information anxiety, teaching information literacy strategies and skills for college res readiness. Um, a couple of speakers who will be joining us um, did you, let me see here. Yeah. from uh, UNO, and they're in the library science um, program there, and they're going to talk about how to prepare the students um, in your school library for going into college. Um, this could also apply to public libraries as well, though, because if you've got people coming into your public library as well who are in the same situation, um, yeah. these are things that you can use as well. Um, so I think it goes across all, even though they are coming at it from this, um, specifically it says, and they're from the school librarian um, experience. So um, definitely sign up and join us for that next week. We are on Facebook, of course. If you go to, on all of our pages, we have a link. You can like um, Encompass Live on Facebook, and we will post notices of new sessions coming up when the recordings are ready, um, reminding you when a new session is supposed to start. So if you're a big Facebook user, definitely like us on Facebook, and you'll be able to keep up with us there. And if you're interested in any other um, learning opportunities, um, this Laura is here monthly. She posts, sends out lists of um, webinars you can attend online. So keep an eye out for her emails <coughs> and blog posts. And, the and they are... That is then a page that you can look mm -hmm. at. Yeah, there's a page on our, on our website. website. Which I should find that too. Um, and also we have our Nebraska Learns 2.0 program, which is where we offer as a um, lesson, a thing, a month that you can learn about and a book that you can read every month. Um, you can earn continuing education credits through this. So you can read this book, You Are Not a Gadget, this month if you want to, and write a little blog post about it. If you've already read the book in the past, you can just review it now. You don't have to read it all over again. <laughs> Um, and this month, our thing, if I scroll down here, is social news sites. I don't know if I scroll in. Where is it? There we go. 
so you can explore sites like Dig and Reddit that are out there to um, see information about, um, read up about news and um, share things with um, people. So um, take a look at that as well. These um, are these are opportunities to um, learn at your own pace um, and learn, you know, what's really applicable to you and earn C credit while you while you do it. So when you do do a thing, let us know, and, and we will record CE credit for you. Yep, you can submit and get credit for those. Um, there's a new one every month. You can do it if you want to. Um, if it's a thing that you're not interested in or if it's a thing that you um, just don't have time that month, it's a summer reading program or whatever, feel free and just wait and see what next month is and do that yeah. one. Um, it's an ongoing program, so you can see what's new every month on there. Um, so other than that, I think we are wrapped up for this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, again. Thank you, thank everyone, you for attending, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.